Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Metaverse Show. This week, I've got Pierce Kicks of Delphi Digital, um, one of my favorite people in the Metaverse. Uh, we're going to be talking about his recent thesis on the open Metaverse. Annoyingly, he beat me to it by about a week. Um, <laughs> but actually, he managed to cover it in much greater depth than I could have ever dreamt of doing. And so we're going to kind of talk through both that, his perspective on the space and, and everything that he finds interesting. So thanks for joining us on the show. Hey guys, thanks, thanks for coming. Me. So we've got you as Quantum Calamari. Um, That's me. Uh, is, is there a rationale, is there a reasoning behind that? And if there is, do we do? should we know about it? Um, nothing in particular. I uh, encountered someone called Quantic Calamari in a game called uh, Space Junkies one evening and I enjoyed it. So uh, now it's me. Very good. And of course you're like an avid Gamer, I believe, we, weren't you like professional at one point? Uh, played pretty competitively at Rainbow Six. Yeah, I was top 100 for a period of time, um, but not, not, I wouldn't say professional. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I remember when that wouldn't have been impressive, but of course now it's like the coolest <laughs> thing that you could you could ever you could ever do. Um, and we were just kind of joking off air that it uh, it was very painful for you to have to choose an avatar um, to present mm -hmm. yourself to the world. So indeed it was. Um, I, uh, I I panicked into choosing Mute, who's a Rainbow Six operator. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> right, perfect. I'm looking good. Well, I'm looking good. Yeah, and you know, at least you're on on uh, on topic, um, given your kind of gaming background. So, cool. So, as I said, um, I mean, there's lots we want to talk about, but it'd be great to just get a quick intro from you. Um, you've obviously been at Delphi for some time, leading kind of gaming and metaverse for them, and you've just recently moved into a new gig. But maybe you could just give us a bit of background, your journey at Delphi, maybe prior to that, and uh, and a little bit about your new gig, and then we'll jump into the thesis. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, prior to Delphi, I kind of got involved with crypto pretty early on, again, through video games. I uh, was messing around with RuneScape back in, the, uh, back in the glory days around some sort of gold farming related activities. And uh, that's how I actually got my, my original introduction to Bitcoin. Um, obviously, kind of went down the rabbit hole as the years went by, um, you know, went on to study computer science and philosophy. I've always felt like uh, that was a pretty cool blend. And, you know, some of the ideas and technology behind this stuff excited me enormously. And uh, yeah, along the way, was uh, lucky enough to kind of cross paths with the Delphi guys. And, um, you know, we, we eventually kind of uh, sort of launched the Delphi Venture Arm together, um, which has been a wicked journey. Um, you know, uh, How long ago was that now then? That was a, a few years, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, that was sort of uh, back end of 2019 that uh, the, the sort of fund uh, came about. Um, but uh, yeah, super fortunate to have worked with such a cool group of people. Um, on a still going to continue to um, you know do some work in that capacity around Delphi. But uh, most recently, super excited to have moved over to uh, Bitcraft, who are one of the first dedicated gaming funds in the world. Originally focused on esports, but have now expanded their scope to um, you know gaming and interactive media more broadly. And they kind of uh, rally around this synthetic reality vision, which is effectively you know a lot of what we talk about. Uh, you know the gradual convergence of the digital and the natural worlds into all kinds of new and interesting experiences over the, the coming decades. And how much of I guess the stuff that um, we're probably closer to in terms of our activities, like um, you know, the metaverse leveraging DeFi, things like NFTs, how much of that will be a continued focus for you in your new gig? Well, I'm hoping that um, with time, as you know, this kind of uh, era of focus matures, uh, I think like the investability of it from perhaps a more traditionally focused fund um, will increase. Uh, I still think it's it's probably a bit early to state that it's uh, you know going to be a sort of cool focus for the time being, but it's certainly something I'm pushing for. Um, you know, as as I touched upon in in, in the piece that you referenced, uh, I think there's enormous potential uh, with these technologies, and I'm, I'm really excited to see the convergence of. You know nfts crypto crypto more broadly you know DeFi and, and gaming i think there's some really interesting behaviors being unlocked well i mean i think it's great for the open metaverse and for the whole crypto space generally that we've got you as a trojan horse in <laughs> uh, some more established uh, kind of gaming you know venture arms so that's awesome um so look let's get straight into it let's talk about your awesome open metaverse thesis was that the title i can't remember now uh, it was called <clears throat> Into the Void, Where Crypto Meets the Metaverse. There you go. There you go. Um, so you've obviously got some uh, kind of key slides and stuff to talk us through. I mean, it was a monster. Uh, I think it was a blog post format, right? And it was like a big read. It took me it took me a whole weekend because not only was it very long, but very detailed. And so I had to kind of keep coming back to it like a good book, right? You have to keep going back to it, rereading it to make sure you processed it in the right way. So. 
I was both very grateful and hateful of the fact that you wrote it because it, it like killed my whole weekend and you gave me no prior warning. But um, let, let's talk through it at a high level. So, you know, what inspired you to, to write it? You know, what was the kind of general thrust of it? And then maybe you could talk us through some of the key highlights. Sure. So I think kind of the original inspiration was, um, you know, those of us in this space uh, feel very strongly that there's something very interesting happening here, something pretty fundamental uh, being unlocked. And, um, you know, I feel like we often get carried away, people within the crypto ecosystem sort of focused on what we're doing and um, to some extent kind of neglecting the bigger picture. And, you know, what I set out to do with the essay was kind of frame it in the broader context of, you know, not just how this is going to intersect other entertainment industries, but kind of what it means and the role it plays in our journey as a digital species. Um, I really think that, you know, a, a lot of these technologies being unlocked have a hugely important part to play in, you know, where we go from here. Uh, you know, the, the Web3 systems of tomorrow that we build that maybe can shed the shackles of these kind of, uh, you know, Web2 business models, which are very much exploitative and value extractive. Um, so that's kind of how, what I originally set out to do. I actually first wanted to start writing it in, um, you know, back in 2019 and early 2020, but I felt like, you know, there wasn't yet enough en enough of a compelling pay uh, uh, case on paper, uh, data-wise around some of these projects and, and their sort of maturity. But I think 2020, obviously that changed. And um, I mean, quite obviously that's changed now this year again, things have kind of gone into warp speed. I think your thesis was the trigger, right? It, it, everything mm -hmm. happened after your thesis came out. And I think it was interesting because, as I said, it came out roughly around a time um, that we managed to kind of get our open metaverse OS out. And that for me was a byproduct of just getting like a moment of breath over the Christmas period. I don't know if it was the same for you. I mean, that was taking you bloody ages to, to put together. I mean, it was incredibly comprehensive. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been trying to chip away at it for a while and then just thought, Scott, I wanted to release it on uh, New Year's Day, but um, I, I, I was late to do so. So I ended up just putting in a couple of weeks, staying up all night writing it and then, uh, yeah, got it out there. got some great feedback and then been really encouraged by all the conversations we've had since, um, you know, obviously Tim Sweeney read it and uh, thought it was of interest, which was really exciting. And, um, you know, the hopes that uh, that is a relatively coherent narrative that kind of communicates why this should be interesting to the perhaps more traditional folk and and hopefully um, kind of legitimize conversation around it a bit. Um, that that's kind of kind of the objective with it. Well, I found it hugely helpful because, of course, I went immediately into your Twitter slipstream and uh, made sure that he saw the open metaverse OS thesis, and I also got a comment. But that was only because you managed to unlock him, and I think. That was huge testament to the space because, of course, uh, you know, I don't, and I don't know how you feel about that, but the reality is that they are the Web two models currently, right? Applied in the gaming space, they are closed proprietary platforms. It's locked digital wealth. Um, now, of course, there's a bit of a tanker to turn around there, unlike a totally new proposition. But um, I think it's interesting that clearly this is very much at the front of his mind about how he future proofs everything that they're building over there. So maybe let's start at the top. Let, um, if you could walk us through kind of the, the, the key elements of the narrative and then talk to any kind of key stats. And I, we, I believe we're going to kind of cut all of this in as we go for the audience. Uh Absolutely, yeah. So I kind of started off the essay just talking about, um, you know, a brief kind of reflection on what our digital journey has looked like so far. You know, I, I referenced the fact that a lot of people forget that it's literally only been, you know, 50, 60 years since the ARPANET, you know, sent that first two-letter communication uh, spelling out low before crashing. And obviously the rate of development has been pretty spectacular since, you know, it took a good nearly uh, 20 years basically for the web to develop and obviously that happened in the back end of the uh, 80s early 90s and um, it's just been insane to see this technology proliferate and now you know there's nearly 5 billion people online um, that's hugely exciting um, but at the same time obviously again emergence of you know all the biggest companies in the world the tech companies and as we've seen time and time again, be it, you know, Cambridge Analytica or all of the sort of frictions around some of the kind of censorship discussions and whatnot out there. Um, these things also have quite clear drawbacks that for the first time, um, people not only are talking about, you know, very publicly, but actually have the tools to develop things, develop new systems 
um, that might help sort of immunize us from some of these similar behaviors as we move forward, as you know, the next two, three billion people come online. Um, and from there, I kind of wanted to touch upon how, the role that video games play in that, right? Um, there's a graph that I think we'll chuck in that, that just shows, um, you know, global sort of internet, well, global population growth, uh, internet penetration, and then percentage of those uh, internet users that are gamers. And right. it's, you know, moves in lockstep. Uh, it's in the, you know, it's nearly 3 billion daily video game players now. And it's um, video gaming is, is, is playing a fundamental role in uh, forcing the evolution of these technologies, you know, from networking to graphics processing. It's been a primary driver of all of this stuff. It's now, a, you know, gargantuan industry. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the segue I wanted to use to kind of frame it, because obviously I love gaming and uh, it's one of the areas of application of a lot of this stuff that I'm super excited about. And I also think it's, um, you know, the one that will perhaps resonate and be more intuitive to most people in terms of crypto adoption and application of these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes sense, both in terms of, you know, people that are gamers themselves, even if it's kind of, uh, you know, on a more casual basis. Uh, or for older generations, almost definitely, you know, their kids, grandkids, they'll, they'll be watching them constantly plugged into these things and increasingly these headsets that we've got on now. Um, and how much has people like Jaron Lanier informed kind of your thinking? Because, of course, he's been in, in forming a lot of philosophical thought very early on in, in, in the 80s when he was thinking about as we as the metaverse and we begin to go into virtual worlds, to the point whereby I think I don't think he's on any social media, is he now? He's like he's vehemently yeah. opposed to Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And absolutely, yeah. No, I mean he's been obviously I've, I've read most of his stuff. He's been hugely influential, even even the more recent stuff. You know, like uh, who owns the future and whatnot. I think um, he's an incredible visionary, and I mean it's kind of scary almost how uh, early he saw all of this stuff, way before others. Um, you know, the same is true, obviously, of some of the great sort of sci-fi authors, like uh, whether it's William Gibson or um, uh, Neil Stephenson, um, super exciting stuff around that. And um, I mean, I, I think it is really important. I also actually, um, you know, Kevin Kelly of Wired to some extent, too. I mean, he has some really interesting, as you say, philosophical grounding to these profoundly important conversations, which for some reason are often not recognized as such. And yet they touch billions of lives every single day often negatively. Um, so I'm glad that the conversation and tone of conversation and the seriousness with which they're taken is, is definitely evolving. Um, and I don't think, you know, the, the conversation would be where it is without people like uh, Lanier. Yeah, and it's really interesting you mentioned Kevin Kelly because, of course, you know, things like Whole Earth Catalog and the whole cybernetics movement was when a lot of the kind of hippie movement was converging with technology and and people were beginning to kind of think about at a very philosophical level where all this stuff will be going but let's kind of get back to the paper so what is the direction of travel now so as you said i think it's it's most likely that you know the open metaverse is going to be driven by gaming gaming culture game behavior you can certainly see that in the nft space you've now got clans which are running DAOs. they're kind of taking you know digital assets under management they're doing all kinds of crazy things with them offering new forms of decentralized governance but where do you think where do you think gaming and crypto converge um yeah i think you, you know you obviously mentioned nfts and the vast bulk of the activity we've seen has been driven more around the sort of collectible space if not the sort of crypto economy intersection where all of a sudden creators are able to monetize directly with their audiences, you know, completely free of all of these sort of intermediaries and also um, kind of embed interesting audience interactions around that. Um, you know, obviously now audiences themselves are becoming owners in these things that the value proposition to each stakeholder there is super clear and the technology to deliver on it is already there. As such, we're seeing this massive influx of enthusiasm. That is perhaps less true for gaming, right? On, on, on the one hand, we've got these wicked games um, that are really embracing deep blockchain integration and that's fundamental to their very sort of value proposition. You know, the Axie Infinities of the world, the play to earn sort of movement whereby, you know, everything it runs on the chain. Every single asset is tokenized. You know, there's a native game currency. There's also a governance token around the game. In fact, you know, the only way the developers actually kind of uh, earn money is through the token appreciation because all the fees are flowing to this kind of community treasury and whatnot. Now, whilst that's a super cool model and I regard it as an entirely new game genre and business model around them, that's 
probably not attractive right to most existing ip holders it's probably pretty scary for uh most game developers trying to engage this space so i actually think we're going to see much more kind of vanilla integrations with people with existing established ip um so just think straight up cosmetics think counter strike go skins but on the blockchain with uh you know game or publisher operated marketplace um and Whilst we probably don't have any major case uh, cases in point just yet, and you know, I think we're probably within 12 months of a, a big publisher um, coming in and trying this with a relatively well-known title. Um, and at that point, you know, once they see that there are these kind of additional revenue streams they can tap into uh, for those kind of super fans of these games, the people that are willing to, you know, pay that extra amount for that blockchain-based skin and you know participate in all the cool economics around that. Um, they're going to see that you know it doesn't necessarily eat into existing revenue streams it's very much additive and it also unlocks like a whole new dimension of again like audience interactivity whereby these players are actually owners in what they're doing therefore more likely to invest recommend to friends evangelize whatever um that's a super interesting aspect and uh yeah i think we're, we're not far away from seeing that start to happen and so so that's interesting you think it's going to be kind of more um so you think it's, it's going to be primarily these centralized platforms uh, gradually migrating into kind of more open systems um, rather than necessarily they're going to be wholesale disrupted. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, don't, I don't think any large IP holder is going to jump in and do a Axie level integration with blockchain anytime soon. Um, and that's okay. We don't need them to, you know, there's people from within crypto, there's, you know, the Axies, the Alluviums, a bunch of other games that are, really embracing this stuff and pushing this model forwards and seeing what the cool mechanics we can sort of unlock are. Um, and whilst that happens on the one hand, you know, the stuff I just described can happen on the other. Uh, and I don't think, you know, they're in any way combative. There's, there's plenty of room for that right now. And what do you think about uh, these kind of bridges that allow, so things like Discord, I'm seeing lots of NFT integrations into things like Discord. Discord's obviously um, a really big environment for, for gamers and, um, you know, there's a good argument that that might be the first place where they actually experience an NFT without necessarily understanding it. I mean, how much do you subscribe to the role of Discord in um, extending or accelerating the open metaverse? And are there at, at, or any other kind of bridges or, or, or channels that will make that happen? Absolutely. Yeah, I think Discord is obviously of profound importance to definitely the crypto ecosystem, but also just gaming at large. I think um, as you described, these integrations which already exist are awesome. The fact that you can build, you know, entire DAOs and governance structures straight into Discord is really interesting. You know, you look at the whale community. When I was chatting with Whale Shark and asked around, you know, why have you built a DAO into the Discord? He was like, um, you know, got no interest in kind of fracturing the user journey, right? Why should right. people rallying around this community have to go to an external page to vote on things? And that makes so much sense. And we're already beginning to see it. Um, beyond um, kind of Discord, I 100% I, I think there's um, similar such more kind of uh, Web2 oriented integration points that make a ton of sense. Uh, you know, just today I was chatting to the guys from Arcane and um, they basically uh, set up their, you know, social login wallets such that if you have a mailing list, you can literally airdrop NFTs to the entire mailing list to their emails and it will auto generate them a wallet and they just log in and retrieve it. And then bam, like that's a pretty cool way to introduce people to this ecosystem. So yeah, excited for things like that for sure. And then kind of finally, where, where do you think all this stuff's going, right? Because I mean, there's so many moving parts um, on the one hand, there's lots of exciting stuff happening within the NFT space. There's lots of creators coming into it. But on the other hand, like to what extent can a Decentraland actually compete with a AAA game studio with billions of dollars of budget and thousands of developers, you know, given the time, effort and resource required for to create a level of content that is now expected by the average person? You know, are they going to are they going to? what are they going to tolerate coming into an environment where it's you know empty empty worlds with subpar content um no they won't and i firmly believe that no crypto experience is going to be even remotely competitive until that massive gulf is bridged um you know like i'm really glad for all the experimentation going on across all of the existing you know blockchain based virtual worlds but it's really like not going to be shocking to me if a AAA does turn around in the next few years and decides to build their own, you know, obviously leverage an existing player base, much, much bigger developer bench. Like 
Um, and, you know, I think they'll, they'll, they can take the cake there. I don't think it's going to be like a one or even few worlds to rule them all kind of thing. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a bunch of different winners. And, and again, like different aesthetics, different communities, different, there are so many variables which would uh, appeal to a different player, to a different user that I just refuse to believe that there's like some kind of, you know, something that has universal appeal. Um, I mean, we see that even at the highest end of the game industry. So I think there's huge opportunity, massive kind of white space for this stuff. But um, I think those projects that do exist are just so important in terms of informing, you know, what sort of more mainstream studio participation might look like down the road. Again, stress testing with these mechanics, figuring out what does and doesn't work. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we've got a, a long way to go in terms of development with all this stuff. Um, you know, I, I mean, we're talking 10, 20, 30 years of experimentation around this stuff. I think it's uh, it's uh, good to be excited early on, but yeah, we've got a long way to go. We'll be old men, peers, and sadly, I, I suspect <laughs> I'm probably going to be older than you. Um, look, it's been great having you on, um, uh, peers, aka Quantum Calamari. Um, <laughs> how can people find you on the web other than kind of lurking around in a metaverse or maybe in the metaverse? Like, are you in certain places in VR chat? Is it easier to catch you on Twitter, Discord? Where are you yeah. at, and how can people follow what you're up to? I'm, I'm anything game related as Quantum Calamari. You can get me on Twitch and all that good stuff. Um, but otherwise, uh, at Piers Kicks on Twitter, um, that's pretty much my primary uh, point of engagement um, online. So uh, yeah, more than happy to uh, chat with anyone whenever, uh, discuss all this exciting stuff going on. So um, please reach out if you're uh, you know building or investing or researching in any of this stuff. Yeah, awesome. And look, you know, I think we, we kind of had to have you on as the second guest. The first one was Ryan Gill. I know you've also uh, invested in what they're doing at Crucible. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how they play out this year. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, make sure you dial in next week. We'll be going live every Friday afternoon with a new guest. Um, not just investors and great thinkers and thought leaders like peers, but also creators. Um, a lot of key key founders. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube, Outlive Ventures. It's youtube.com slash Outlive Ventures. You can follow me, Jamie247, on Twitter or Outlier OVO IO HQ. Thanks for joining us. That's great. <laughs>